We are at uh, Beth Messiah Synagogue. We're continuing our Messianic Foundations class. This is session three already, rolling right along. I don't know how many sessions this is actually going to be just yet. Somewhere around 10, maybe 12, maybe 15. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. There's a lot I want to talk about. So um, for those of you that did join in when we did the last time, the Appointed Times class, we talked about all the holidays. We are encompassing that within this, but there's more to this class as well. And by the way, I don't know if I made this clear before, but besides just being a good class for everyone to be a part of, uh, besides it being you know good information for everyone to just kind of get on the same page with the mission and the culture of our community, um, I also do want this to be somewhat of a prerequisite for membership moving forward. Um, and with that said, if you've been attending here a while and you are no longer, or not yet rather, a you know formal member of the congregation, um, following this class, some point shortly after we're finished with this class, for those who are interested in becoming members of the congregation, we can do that. Uh, we move forward and we'll have a little bit of our service where we, you know, welcome you into the community and it's a nice little, it's a nice little thing. Um, the only things that we're requiring, what's that? <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll fill it up. Maybe it'll be warm by then. We'll see. But, uh, um, the only thing that we do require outside of attending the class, of course, I'd like to meet and talk with you if we really haven't done too much of that. But um, if you have a previous place of worship, we'd like a, re a let if it's possible at all, a letter of recommendation from your previous clergy. Um, just you know, it's it's good. <laughs> it's good to do. If that's not possible, of course, you know, for either if you don't have contact with them or you don't have a previous place of worship, you know, we could talk about that. But <clears throat> we're we're looking forward to. Uh, welcoming some new members in the next, you know, couple of months. So if you are interested in that, we haven't done that yet. Talk to me. Talk to me. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray, and then we'll um, we'll get right into it. Yeah. Huh? No, 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 no. There's no, there's no membership renewal. The question was, do you need to renew? Do you need to re? Uh, yeah, you. The dues are due, and. <laughs> And we've increased, we've increased like your HOA, right? Like it's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, we laugh, but that's how a lot of synagogues actually are run. Instead of people giving regularly like we do here, you know, people pay dues and buy tickets and that's just an alternate way of funding the community, you know, is what it is. I, I think, well, I think it's better the way we do it now, but that's me. So. Um, we're going to get into the biblical calendar. So last week we talked about um, Shabbat in particular, and I said that I would be able to kind of fill out the understanding a little bit by talking about the calendar as a whole. But I didn't get to, if you remember last week, I taught you what an, an Arab Shabbat at my house looks like, a Friday night. And it was requested that I um, make some copies of, of the liturgy that I use at home. So I'll make that, sorry, hiccups. Uh, I'll make that available. Um, for anyone who, who'd like that, I can email it for anyone who wants a, a digital copy, and then you can change it for however you want it for your family. Um, just let me know, and but I'll make I'll make paper copies too. So we'll do that for next week. Um, what I didn't I keep wanting to set this down in here, but it is one hundred percent gonna spill. Mm. Oh, good, it's here. Um, the thing I didn't get to explain was havdalah. I said we'd start with that this week. So havdalah uh, is. A, just like Arab Shabbat is a little ceremony to welcome in the Sabbath on a Friday night, Havdalah is a little ceremony that we do on Saturday evening once it's evening and the Shabbat is over and we're saying goodbye to the Shabbat. And um, we do a pretty traditional Havdalah, albeit, you know, condensed. Listen, you can make these little things into very elaborate religious rites if you want to. And I would just say, in regard to liturgy, because a lot of people get intimidated by it all, do what is beneficial for you and your family, right? You're not impressing anybody by having loads and loads and loads of liturgy just for the sake of it. If it's not, if it's not going to be edifying to you or the people you're with, scrap it, scrap it, right? Um, that's, that's my encouragement to you. But uh, so the Havdalah service, Havdalah means the separation. So it's a separation of the Shabbat with the rest of our week that we're moving into, right? And um, of course, I didn't bring all my Havdalah set. Why would I remember to do that? But uh, Havdalah has similar elements to the Friday night service in that there is a candle 
it's a different type of candle than, than the Shabbat one. I will bring one in. It's a braided candle with many wicks on one candle. In fact, a lot of times people don't call it a candle. They just call it a Havdalah torch. Uh, it's, it's a different thing. Um, there's the torch. There is a cup of wine, which is similar to Friday night. And then there's a separate thing. Uh, I brought this, by the way, if you've gone to our, um, our Sukkot camp trips, I, you know, I bring this and, and we do Havdalah at the end of Shabbat there. But there's a little container of spices. Uh, it could be cloves or cinnamon or other things that are aromatic. And here's the idea. So in the Havdalah liturgy, I can't get it together today. In the Havdalah liturgy, we are using these physical elements to entertain all of our senses. And all of our senses are meant to uh, be reminded of the sweetness and the joy of the Shabbat. So the Shabbat that we've just enjoyed, we are kind of retaining and, 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 um, and savoring that. And allowing that joy to, you know, uh, to go out over our coming week. That's the idea, right? Now, listen, don't be too theological about that. My joy comes from Yeshua every moment of every day, right? And truly, as far as the gospel is concerned, I don't need to be filled up on one day, run myself to empty, and then fill up again on Shabbat. That's not how our lives are supposed to go, right? That, that's not Yeshua's intention for us, to fill up with joy, run down to empty, and then fill up with joy again. No, he wants to fill us continually. It's overflowing, right? We don't ever need to run to empty. Do we feel empty sometimes? Yes. Is that the design? Is that what's best for us? No, it's not. The test of endurance or something. That's, that's not what he has for us. However, um, it's good to have ceremonies that help us remember and help us connect, right? So um, here's how the Havdalah service looks. Uh, in our home, we start with a reading of this little prose um, blessing, and then it turns into a song, and the song continues through the entire, the song is how we sing all of the liturgy, it's one song, and I'll sing it for you, uh, and do it, so it starts like this, we read, it says, behold, and this is, by the way, slivers of, of text from, oh shoot, Daniel and Isaiah, and, and maybe Psalms as well, but it's, it's a mixture of, of things, all from the scriptures, it says, behold, God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. By the way, I'm holding the glass of wine as I'm saying all this. And I've already lit the torch, right? So, sorry. Friday night, we light the candles to be a reminder of God's presence among us as we're entering into the Shabbat. The torch is supposed to be, on Havdalah, is supposed to be a symbol of the Shabbat itself, right? And because we're going to extinguish it at the end, right? We're saying goodbye to the Shabbat. So the torch is lit. I'm holding the cup. Whoever is with us is all around. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song, and he also has become my salvation. You've probably heard that passage before. We've sung it lots of times, right? And with joy you shall draw forth water from the springs of salvation. Salvation is the Lord's. Upon your people be your blessing. Selah. The Lord of hosts is with us. A stronghold for us is the God of Jacob. Selah. Lord of hosts, praised is the man who trusts in you. Lord, save, and may the king answer us on the day when we call. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. So may it be for us. I will lift up the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. And then we begin to sing. And the singing includes four blessings. We have the blessing for the cup. We have the blessing for the torch. We have the blessing for the spices. And then there's a final blessing for the ending of the Shabbat. And the melody is very simple. It goes like this. We go, And the first blessing goes like this. It's, it's the Bre uh, Pri Hagafen. It's the wine blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Amen. We all bang on the table. And, and then it continues. Until the next one, right? So we, I, I drink from the cup. I might share that. I might not. It's all mine. Um, and then the next blessing is the blessing of the bisamim, the, the uh, many species of spices. So we have this little container of spices. The container traditionally has a little flag on the top of it because his banner over us is love. That's, that's meant to be a reminder of that. So we open up the container and it has aromatic spices in it. 
we say the blessing. It's the same melody. It's but it's Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Borei Menei Visamim. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the Universe, who creates many species of spices. You smell it, and then you pass it around to everybody at the table as we continue to sing. So we've tasted the sweetness of Shabbat. I can see the light of the Shabbat with our eyes. I'm hearing the beauty of the melody. I'm smelling the spices. Do you see how we're involving all of our senses? That's the idea. In fact, the next blessing is the blessing for the torch. Uh, the same, again, same melody. Doing the same thing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei morei ha'esh. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the Universe, who creates the lights of fire. And what you often do traditionally is hold out your hand towards the torch so that you can see your fingernails, so you can see the light of the torch reflected in your fingernails compared to the non-reflective surface of your hands, and it's just, just a little tradition. So you can see the reflections, the, the product of the light. That's the idea, right? Um, and then the, we continue with the melody, and then the last blessing is the longer one. Uh, it's in English. It's, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who makes a distinction between the holy and the secular, light and darkness, Israel and the nations, the seventh day and the six days of labor. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes a distinction between the holy and the secular. Um, if you were in the Torah study the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the fact that the Exodus narrative reminds us of the character of God, that he is the God who makes distinctions, right? He makes a distinction between his people and the rest of the world. Not that he doesn't care for the rest of the world, but he makes a distinction. Holiness is a distinction, right? Amidst non-holiness, right? Light out of darkness, all of these things. So we're reminded of that. So we take a drink from the cup one more time. And then what we do, there's a plate that the cup and everything sits on. Uh, at the final part of it, we take what's left in the cup and I pour it out in the plate, just a little bit of wine that's left. And then we take the torch and I extinguish it in the wine there, right? So it's like saying the Shabbat is over. And then we would say to everybody who's around Shavua Tov, Shavua Tov means to a good week, right? Like we say, Shabbat Shalom, it's a, it's a greeting, but we're saying, now that the Shabbat is over, may the week be blessed. And then there's a, there's a Shavuot Tov song that we sing. Shavuot Tov, Shavuot Tov, a good week, a week of peace. May gladness reign and joy increase. A good week, a week of peace. May gladness reign and joy increase. It's just a nice little song. Then traditionally, there's another song that points to our Messianic hope. And... Uh, the song is called Eliyahu. Eliyahu is Elijah, right? Eliyahu Hanavi, uh, Elijah the prophet, right? And the song is waiting. It's it, Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu Hagidali, Bimhera Veamenu, Yavo Alenu, I Mashiach Ben David. It means this Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah from Giladi. Quickly and in our day, come to us with the Messiah, son of David. Now, some believers would say they don't feel comfortable singing that because. Messiah already has come, and Messiah said that John the Immerser, John the Baptist, was that Elijah, right? So to wait and call for him is like we're not recognizing that he's already come. However, and this is, you know, everyone is entitled to their opinion and what they do in their own home. I like to sing it in our home because Yeshua even said when he was asked about this, he said, indeed, Elijah is still to come. Speaking of his return, there's an Elijah that's going to herald his coming as well. And then he goes on to say, but he, if you can accept it, he has already come as well. Speaking of John the Baptist, Bible lesson outside of the scope of this. But I, I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to continue to sing Eliyahu because we're waiting for his return. It's not me saying I don't believe Messiah has already come. I'm saying I'm waiting for his return. Same concept. Same concept. It's a messianic hope. It's a messianic hope. Okay. Any, any questions about Havdalah? This is, um, I can make this available to everybody too. This is just a copy out of a Messianic Siddur, a prayer book that um, has all of those blessings in Hebrew and transliterated and English. Um, I'll make a bunch of copies if you like those. Yeah, cool. All right. If there's no questions about Havdalah, let's get into the calendar, right? Um, you will hear me interchangeably refer to the calendar as both the biblical calendar and the Jewish calendar. Um, I have in the past been more emphatic about referring to it as the biblical calendar as opposed to the Jewish calendar. And the reason is because although the calendar that I'm referring to is found primarily in Jewish culture and among Jewish people, 
the calendar was established in the scripture by God and then given to Israel. So it's, it's God's calendar. Of course, it's been predominantly um, kept by Jewish people, but uh, the scope of God's calendar and all of his teachings was never meant to remain with one specific group, right? The people of Israel, in fact, are being called out as his particular people was meant to be, we were meant to be ambassadors, right? To bring others to us. Um, you will hear me call the Jewish calendar too. It's not wrong. It's not one better or worse. Um, the fact is that Jewish people have primarily kept the calendar and, and other groups of people never knew to or never did. And uh, anyway, Israel, like I said, Israel was always meant to be an ambassador for the Lord to the world. Uh, here's what it says in Isaiah 49, by the way, to that point. Isaiah 49, verse 3 and verse 6. It says, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Like, show my glory to who? To the rest of the world, right? Right? An ambassador. Um, the Good News Translation, if you ever read that before, it says, because of you, people will praise me. Right? Israel, because of you, people, other people, nations will praise me. And then skip down to verse 6, same chapter, Isaiah 49, 6. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Okay, so that's, that's the calling of the believing remnant of Jewish people. And for us as a Messianic community, as Jews and Gentiles alike, worshiping together as one new man with a goal of bringing the gospel back to the original messengers. That's, that's one of our primary reasons for existing. Which we discussed a couple of weeks ago. So, we see the beginning of that fulfillment of Israel being an ambassador and a light to the nations. We see the beginning of that fulfillment in the New Testament literature, right? With Gentiles professing faith in the God of Israel via the Messiah, Yeshua, if I'm not clear about that, who that is, right? <laughs> Yeshua continued to follow the biblical calendar, including all of the appointed times, as did his followers, even after his ascension. Once he went to the kingdom, they continued. They continued. It didn't go away. It wasn't retired. It wasn't replaced with, you know, Christmas and Easter or whatever else, right? It's just, it, just, it just wasn't. It wasn't replaced. It was continued. Uh, and we have biblical examples of that, Yeshua uh, doing so. Luke 4, 16, Yeshua and the Shabbat, for instance. It says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Okay? Yeshua honored the Sabbath, continued to. Uh, Yeshua and Sukkot. How about this? Uh, John 7. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, we're speaking of Sukkot here, it's the context. Yeshua stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So he used Sukkot. Not only was he in the right place at the right time to celebrate Sukkot, you notice in Yeshua's ministry, most of the time he's in Jerusalem is around a holy day. He's there. He's He's there on purpose. He spent most of his time otherwise in the Galilee. That's where he liked to hang out. But for holy days, he's in Jerusalem because that's where you're supposed to be on the holy days. Right? Uh, John 10, uh, we talked about this just over Hanukkah time, Yeshua and Hanukkah. Uh, at that time, the Feast of the Dedication, Hanukkah, took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon in Jerusalem on Hanukkah. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And guess what he does? Later on, verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. So he even used Hanukkah as the springboard to declare not only his Messiahship, but clearly his divinity. His divinity. So we have all these examples of Yeshua keeping the holy days. The calendar is, is what it is, right? Um. I started to say before, however, I will sometimes call it the Jewish calendar, maybe as opposed to the biblical calendar, sometimes purposely, sometimes not. But um, the fact is that, first of all, it's a common phrase. The Jewish calendar is what you'll hear people say more often than not to refer to the biblical holy days and so on. Um, but at some point in relative modern history, the Jewish calendar was uh, became fixed. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, and I'll explain this a little more in a bit, but uh, the calendar was controlled by the priesthood in biblical days and before, where the priests, month on month, were the authority to decide when a new month began by, you know, observing the moon, and 
when to add leap months, additional months, if the lunar cycle seems to be getting off with the harvest timing. Because the calendar that we follow, and I'll explain this in a moment, the calendar that we follow is not just a lunar calendar. It is a intercalated lunar calendar. In other words, it's a predominantly lunar calendar, meaning it follows the cycles of the moon. But the holy days are tied to seasons. And seasons refer to the cycle of the sun. The cycle of the sun and the cycle of the moon are not the same length. So if we were to follow the cycle of the moon only, eventually spring holidays wouldn't be in the spring anymore. They would creep along in the year. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the point is sometimes at one point in Jewish history, the calendar was mathematically fixed. And th at that point forward, it was really exclusively called the Jewish calendar because it was the Jewish authority that did that, that mathematical fixing, right? Okay, question. David, wait. I remember right there. Wait for the sliver of the new moon and the two witnesses would have to go to the priest and say we've seen it and then they would declare the new month and it wasn't just anybody these were you know appointed people to do that okay let's say one day goes by overcast no sliver of the moon two days goes by how many days would they wait before they declare it? okay that's it it's the new month now yeah good question uh i don't know the exact answer but if i can guess based on another precedent i was reading about the history of the havdalah ceremony and tradition says that you can do a Havdalah ceremony up to three days after the Shabbat. Why you'd wait till Tuesday to do it, I don't know. But if, if that is a precedent, I would say at least a few days, uh, maybe longer. But I'm, I'd have to look myself to know for sure. That's a good question. I have to check on that, but I think it's like the 13th or 14th century. Yes, that's what I said, quote unquote modern. Yes, yeah. It may have been sooner than that, but I'll, I'll double check. Yes, sir. Sure, I remember everything I said all day. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So, if it is so, um, how that affects the Passover? Uh, it didn't. So, it was a special Sabbath in that it was a holy day Sabbath, a high Sabbath. That's not the same as the weekly Sabbath. So, it didn't adjust the calendar in that way. But I'm I'm going to get to that in just a sec. So, that's good. That's good. So, okay. Let's start with this. We can't have a calendar if we don't understand what a day is, right? Okay. So, a biblical day. In contrast to our you know, common understanding today, it begins in the evening. We started talking about that last week. Here's where this comes from. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And the darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning one day. So taking that. Order, evening before morning, is how the you know, biblical understanding of a day, why it begins in the evening. It starts from there. So, example, yes? What made more sense to, to me when I was trying to make sense of, of that, I'm reading it as, as a kid, when the sun sets, the day ends. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a new day has to begin. Right, right. there's no nothing space in between days, right? Right, but, you know, <laughs> Right. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. So the, you're right. The day ends and thus a new day must begin, right? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yes, yeah. So there's tradition to say that if you can see three stars in the sky, then it's it's sufficiently dark enough for it to be the new day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then that's why we're talking about Shabbat, right? So uh, today's Shabbat began yesterday evening. It'll end at sundown. Tonight, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I know. I think we have to talk to Ben Franklin about that. <laughs> so, yeah, the dunce cap puts you in the corner. Uh huh. 
you've been lonely there by yourself, right, Larry? Yeah. Yeah. So, by the way, speaking of like the world over, you know, there are places in the world where the sun sets maybe much more early or much later. You know, you go to Alaska or something like that, and you have seasons where it's like it never gets fully dark. What do Jewish communities do there? Well, times are determined by locale and community norms, right? The Jewish community kind of just decides together how to do this thing, right? Um, you know, like places like Alaska or whatever. When I used to have to travel with my previous job, uh, the company was based out of the UK. And sometimes I would go there and, you know, 10 o'clock, almost 11 o'clock at night, it would just be like dusk outside. It wouldn't be really in the summertime. It wouldn't get really dark till around midnight. So if you were, you know, upholding some Sabbath observance, it's like, what, do I have to wait till midnight to, to do anything or something like that? And the answer is no. That's, that's not how the Jewish communities in those places behave. You know, they, they've decided at some point. You know, in our previous community in Florida, we would have a Havdalah celebration together. People would come back Saturday evening, we'd do worship, and it was at it was at 6.30, no matter what time of year. So even in the summer, it was in Florida, it was still bright at 6.30, which felt a little funny. But, you know, we would still hang out till the evening anyway, so it, it worked out. <laughs> so we decided. Times, and deter, times are determined by the locale and, and by community norms. Um, and uh, to your point, um, Sherry, uh, for this and every other topic, there are definitions and limitations and other details that can be found in rabbinic literature. For instance, that idea of having to wait to see three stars in the sky comes from our, uh, rabbinic literature. Literature, And um, the reason that l rabbinic literature has to come up with this is because the Bible is not always really specific, right? There's, there's a, a lack of specifics in the Bible about these subjects. Uh, Jewish communities throughout history have come to adopt these details as normative, even as if God gave them himself. Uh, you will find that in religious Jewish communities that the rabbinic literature is often put on the same level of authority as the Bible. And all of it is described sometimes as Torah. So if you were talking to, say, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish person, and they're talking about what the Torah says, they may have a very diff different definition or understanding of what Torah is compared to what you're thinking. Right? You're thinking the five books of Moses they're referring to Torah sometimes as the full compendium of rabbinic writings in relation to the Bible, all of that being called Torah, right? So we might have a difference in understanding what that, uh, what that really refers to. Um, we intend, of course, to be informed about cultural norms and what the rabbis say, because you know, we want to interact with Jewish people in a knowledgeable and culturally sensitive way, uh, but we understand <clears throat> and I want to be very clear about this, we, we understand that rabbinic literature is not authoritative on the same level as scripture, right? We can read rabbinic literature, we can glean from it, we can learn from it, and if it is in line with the scripture says, then, then great, it, it might offer us some really great wisdom. Uh, but there's rabbinic literature that would say that uh, terrible things about Yeshua. And obviously we're not going to take that as, first, certainly not authoritative, nor are we even going to agree with it at all, right? You have a question back there, Bob? Oh, you look like you were churning one up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our motivation is to interact with the Lord and draw closer to him. He doesn't deal with us using shame, shaking a finger at us for not observing appointed times. Please don't go home and be afraid that you don't know how to do these things or you've never done them before and you're worried that God is like, you know, disappointed with you or anything like that that's not the mind of God. Well, unless, so along that line, I remember past years having people call us terrified because they had done something wrong uh -huh. because they didn't do it on the right night. They didn't do it this way. And you have to tell them that's sure. what it's about. Right. Do we want to do things normally and correctly? Yes, of course. That's the goal. We don't want to be flippant with traditions for the sake of doing so. But we're not worried that we're going to be, you know, we're not following the Greek pantheon. And Zeus is not going to strike us down for getting on his nerves. That's just not the, what's that? What? Is it a follow-up? okay. <laughs> you have to take it up with him. I don't know. Instead, instead, our God uses the appointed times, the holy days, the biblical calendar, 
He uses it as a vehicle to draw us closer to him and to teach us about his love for us and his intentions for the world. Each one of the appointed times that we'll get into, each one of them is meant to communicate to us something about his character and something about uh, his plan of salvation, because it all points to Yeshua. It all points to Yeshua. So we don't, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you license. Are you ready? You don't need to be stressed about exactly how to do this and that. Please don't invite more stress into your life. We already all have enough, right? You don't need to be stressed about any of this. We don't need to get stressed about that. We will take our time. We'll learn. And in the process of life and in the process of interacting with him together, we can adopt some helpful practices. So does that, does that feel good to everybody? Good. Uh, let me just share about, okay, we'll share about the biblical week. And I realized I, I missed a piece of my notes. Uh, next week I'll start. I have a chart that I'll, I'll make copies for of the biblical months. We'll, we'll talk about those and the biblical week, even the names of the days and so on. So we'll continue with our calendar discussion next week. I thought I had it with me and I don't. But uh, the biblical week, right? So we understand about a day. Well, a collection of days is called a week. We're building up, okay? We're building up. We have a day. Now we're talking about the biblical week. So the week, the biblical week draws its structure from creation. Yeah? Seven days of creation, six days God did all the work. On the seventh day he rested. Gold star. Uh, Genesis 1 nitpicked a bunch of verses. Uh, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning one day. That's verse 5. Verse 8. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, there was morning, a second day. Verse 13, there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. 19, there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. 23, there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. You're getting the point, right? 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It's the end of his creative work. And then in Genesis 2, the beginning of the second chapter, we read this. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts and all their array, it says in some translations. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. This exact quote is in our Arab Shabbat liturgy that I read last week. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work that God had created and made. So we understand that the, the week six days of work and one day of rest. And you might say, well, I'd like more than one day of rest. And that's fine. <laughs> you live in America. We have a weekend most of the time, right? Most of us only work five days a week. Many of us only work five days a week. Um, the biblical uh, example here was is six days of work based on the six days of creation and a day of rest. And then that day of rest is meant to be a holy convocation. Not a nap, not all day. Take a nap later. You guys, half of you are napping now, but uh, you can nap when you get home. And uh, the point is, is that we build the rhythm of our life based on the rhythm of creation, right? So if the rhythm of our life is tying us into the rhythms that God has made and used since the beginning, it's putting us in tune with his creative nature. You see that? There's something wonderful about that. And that then extends, of course, into the Shabbat and it extends into the holy days and the way our year is structured, right? So I haven't even gotten into months and years. We've only done days and weeks. Uh, next week, we'll pick up with the months and the years. We can talk about jubilees and all those fun things that everyone's very interested in, the different months of the year. Um, to your point, Sarah, uh, God says in the Exodus narrative, right in the midst of this week's Parsha, right before the Passover actually happens, as he's giving the people of Israel instructions for what to do with the lamb, right? He says, this, is, this month is to be the beginning of months to you. In other words, he's saying, I'm, I'm shifting your calendar. On the, um, the Jewish civil calendar that existed up to that point, the month that they were in was not the first month of the year. right? The Rosh Hashanah that we celebrated back in the fall is the beginning of the civil Jewish year. right? There's a couple of annual cycles in the Bible that are running concurrently. The civil year, we'll get into details about this next week. But the civil year begins with Rosh Hashanah, which is how we actually tick up the year, right? We're in the year 5783 on the Jewish calendar, and that began on Rosh Hashanah. To th from that point till now, we would be in the seventh month. And yet, in a, and we, so we continue with that cycle. That didn't go away, right? We still count the year based on that civil cycle that starts and ends on Rosh Hashanah. However, 
what we call the ecclesiastical cycle, the cycle of holy days, right? It begins and ends with the Passover. So even in the seventh month on the civil cycle is the beginning of our cycle of holy day celebrations. That, that shouldn't be too, uh, too weird for us. You know, we think what there's two calendars happening all at once, but all of us have something like that, right? So we, we follow what's called the Gregorian calendar, January, February, March, April, May. We celebrate New Year's, right? But when you were a student, the school year always began in August or September, right? That wasn't so weird. That year began in the middle of your regular year. Or if you work for a business, as a fiscal year that starts in you know, March or something. They're happening, happening concurrently, right? The Bible has multiple new years, the civil one, the ecclesiastical. There's an arboreal one, like the new year for the trees. And there's one other, actually, that I forget. I forget it. But anyway, um, we'll get into all of that. But the point is that the value for us in recognizing the cycle of time, days and weeks, and then moving into months and years according to God's calendar, it puts us in tune with the lessons that God has intended for humanity since the beginning. He's intending to show us his character, show us his heart through these times. And when we honor them and recognize them, we're more in tune and in flow with what he's been doing since the beginning. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Questions? No, yes, Sarah, go ahead. Also, he gave us from Rosh Hashanah seven months and the beginning of something else, mm -hmm. which is another language, another step. Yeah, there's all kinds of new beginnings too, right? Always an opportunity for a fresh start. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> Mike? No, for Europe, when you start a new job as a young person, you get automatically you get like six months of vacation. Mm -hmm. With this. With the calendar that we have and the festivals that we're supposed to have, we, we should be doing that in this country. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of days that could be taken off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We'll talk about that too. Which of the holy days are considered to be Sabbaths and which aren't? Because some are and some aren't. Uh, so we'll get into that too. And I'll have some printouts for you guys next week. Good. Any other questions or comments? Anyone have a testimony as to how maybe adopting a, a biblical perspective on your calendar has been a benefit to your life? Uh, I don't think anyone here, I don't think anyone here, correct me if I'm wrong, grew up celebrating biblical holy days, have you? No one in this room has, right? Some, oh, okay, one person has. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and the Holy Days celebrate that and embrace that. Yeah. Yeah. Seasons and moments, different things to remember, different things to hang on to in those different seasons that God does it all on purpose. Something that we're supposed to remember because we just came out of the holy days and the time and just happy, and that should carry us into the winter months. Yeah. To keep our spirits off and just keep moving. Just like Havdalah, all the joy of the Shabbat we hang on to for the whole week. Right. Yeah. Right. This is the biblical month of Shabbat, by the way. We're in, today's the sixth of Shabbat on the Hebrew calendar. Dan. When you asked the question about how has uh, it's really in the last year or so, studying the calendar, it, it, it finally, it really just dawned on me that when when Jesus stood up and said, uh, and said, I, you know, I'm a living water, mm -hmm. that was, that was on the last day of Sukkot during a water libation ceremony, and then that started to carry forward, and that was six months before his crucifixion. Yeah. And so it occurred to me that the reason God commanded those uh, celebrations in that on those three celebrations of Shavuot, Sukkot, and Passover, mm -hmm. um, all all the Jewish, all all of Israel, uh, at least the men, but I imagine everybody they had to come to Jerusalem to worship, and it, and it struck me the reason God did that was for that day for the Messiah who revealed Himself 
for the for the Messiah who who, who sacrificed himself, and then for Shavuot in in that time to where God with with all the people present and and all of those they were able to witness that, but also that they would all be present in the in filling of this. Well said. Into us. That's exactly right. It was like a wow for me. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, Mike. I think the uh, the first uh, of the appointed feasts that I celebrated was Passover, mm -hmm. and I had some information from traditional Jewish groups, and you know, started going through it, and I was just blown away by how many things in the traditional ceremonies point so clearly to Yeshua. Larry, do you want to share with them your thoughts when you learned about the matzah? Do you remember the unleavened bread separated from the unity, pierced, striped, broken, oh, hidden? Yeah. We went through the imagery of the matzah. Uh, was it last year? Two years ago now? A year ago. Last, year, last, last Passover. And I've never, I've, I've been eating matzah all my life. And, you know, as a secular Jew, I never considered Jesus, Yeshua, as anything but a, a man. We, didn't, we may, may not have done remarkable things, but nothing more. <clears throat> and then, so it was, I guess it was, I guess it was the, the, the Seder when we discussed it. And mm, it was a Torah the, study a week or two before. I remember we were in the back room. Okay. Okay. But the discussion of the Masa, it's striped, which is the stripes on Yeshua's back. And because it, and it's burnt, you know, it, 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 it's Toasted, Bruised. Really, because Yeshua didn't have matzah. They didn't have matzah back then. They just had flat bread. And they, on bread. And then, but, I don't know where matzah came from. You know, probably started with central Just Europe. became factoryized. Yeah. yeah, that's all. But it was just the, the description of the matzah in relation to the Messiah. And it's a physical relation, a description of it. I can't remember exactly what all the words were, but you know, by his stripes we are healed, yes. and there's the stripes yes. and the scars and the burns on, on, on the matzah itself. And I was just sat there and said, Oh my goodness. He was gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> it was very beautiful. Cheryl. No, I just was listening, you know, and even in the Quran, she said that there's no one doing this in the springtime. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hmm, let me look up what spring is. I bet the bump up, that, that is, you know, the beginning. And that's the time, the beginning of the year is a time of renewal. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yep. Like, the daffodils start coming up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah, well, this was my last year was the first year that I actually celebrated the feast day really learned about them to know what it's about the fall feast days. And I took it upon myself, all of the days that were built in that were supposed to be days of rest where you don't do any work. And I took the time to read and it said, you don't do any, I think it's ordinary work. And, mm -hmm. and so I took those days off and took that time to just um, pray and read. And it was, it just blessed me. So I was really blown away. And I'm like, why? You know, why isn't that taught? Like what you said, I was saying, like, why don't we do this? But it was just so refreshing, and it was just such a blessing spiritually. Absolutely. To experience that, yeah. That's great. Russ? Regarding the, um, the matcha and it being burnt, what was the burnt offering for um, ceremonially? When did they do a burnt offering? Oh, all different times. Uh, I don't know one in particular. I'd have to look. But the, uh, oftentimes the, the burning marks on the matzah are, are related to him being bruised. That's, and, that's the idea. Did, I know they did things like, you know, different types of offerings. What was the, the burnt for? What particular, was it a particular type of sin or something? Or you know, circumstance around it? Did they do a burnt offering? I'd have to check to give you a good answer. I'd have to look. I'd have to look. I think the matzah one, once you get into it, Burn. I, I use the word burnt. It wasn't part of the the analogies here. It was it, it was the bruising, and then the matzah is also striated, which is the stripes. Right. 
and, and then it's the unleavened bread all at once. So yeah. that's great. I, I use the wrong word there. Yeah. When I when I do, oh, I, I do it with you guys too. But often I do um, Passover demonstrations in churches a lot in the springtime. I get invited to go speak at churches, and um, so I have the candles lit, and I'll hold the matzah in front of the candle so everyone can see the light through it. You can see the piercing through it. They're always like, ooh, they like, they really like that. <laughs> that's, a, that's something they really like. That's good. All right, well, let's pray, and we'll continue this conversation next week. Abba, thank you again for the opportunity just to dig into your word, to understand what this messianic community and calling is all about. Uh, Lord, we thank you that it's all to your glory. We thank you for Yeshua, who has been revealed. The work is done. The price is paid, and we can be new and live new life in you. I thank you, Lord for what you're teaching us here regarding the calendar and the holy days and just the culture of our messianic community, the reason we're here. Lord, we intend, just like Paul says, that all Israel will be saved, and we know that's going to happen one day. So Lord, we thank you that you've called us to that specific work of being a light to the Jewish people and, of course, to all nations as well. We trust you, Lord. We thank you for calling us and making us yours. It is a joy and an honor to be in your service and to equally be your children. We love you, Lord. We thank you. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um,